Hey, this is Richie Marufo from the Barbed Wire Open Mic Series, a.k.a. BWAMS, and you're listening to the El Paso Creators Podcast Show. If you haven't already, make sure to follow them on Instagram, YouTube, and other social media. Without further ado, here's the show. Check it. My name is Luis Jesus Marin, and I'm on the El Paso Creatives Podcast. And today I'm going to be talking about my art history and what I think is in store in the future and tying it down to what I'm doing right now in the present moment. Awesome. Hey, Luis, what's up? Um, thank you so much for being on the show, man. I appreciate you. I've been trying to get you on in a while, and it's been kind of rough. But Honestly, you, I've been following your podcast, and the people you've had are yeah. really amazing, and I feel privileged to be here. And... I really want to say that I'm really grateful that you're doing this because I think it's really helping the El Paso community out. Yeah, no, dude. And, and I appreciate that. Cause like, there's not a lot of like, so a little interesting story. Like when I first started it, it was a lot of negative feedback first before we got positive feedback. And so I started drifting that away and I started focusing on more of the people who were actual supporters, people who were actually there, like we were helping out. And so it's good to hear that. Like I always enjoy hearing that. And I'm really humbled about it when people are like, yeah, man, I always listen to your episodes like that. Cause you know, it takes every little support that we have to just like, mm -hmm. that's what really matters. You know, a lot of people aren't in for that. But um, before we get talking, let me get my quick introduction. All What's right. up guys. My name is Isaac Hernandez. I'm your host for the Opas Creators podcast show. Um, we're here at the Galeria Lingon, new gallery that we're going to be kind of hosting our show out of and everything. Um, shout out to Tino for letting us use the place. Um, we'll go ahead and leave like their ads and things like that in the description. Um, hopefully start getting sponsors and things like that. That'd be really cool to, to get sponsors and stuff. But um, let's just start off with like, for people who don't know who you are and things like that, let's start off with just like, tell us a little bit about you, you know, who you are, where you come from, things like that. Okay, so I kind of have a weird um, start in El Paso when I was growing up. I Did grew you grow up, up here? Yeah, yeah, so okay. I, I grew up in the Northeast, kind of like on the rim of the Devil's Triangle. Uh, I live in Northeast, so yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, I kind of grew up in like a gang affiliated kind of like family. Okay. And so um, that's just kind of like the culture I was submerged in mm -hmm. in, in the beginning. Uh, my my uncles, my dad, they're all gang members and um, they were in Vatos Northeast, VNE. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they kind of had, I kind of had like a, a, a rough, a rough upbringing. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's mm -hmm. a lot of um, negative influences and there's times where, um, well, my parents divorced when I was one year old and my mom lived in a trailer also in the Northeast and it was really hard. It was very traumatic and um, I don't like talking about it in a way of like, I'm a victim, Yeah. but it was just something I had to overcome. Yeah. And I'm grateful for it because it made me who I am. Mm -hmm. And so you you do just pure painting, right? Like art painting, things like that. Yeah. So did that have a big like influence, I guess, when you were growing up? Like how did painting and things like that kind of distract you from all that? Like Exactly. It was like my, that, you know? it was my escape. Yeah. You know, so like growing up and like all this like violence or like um, just uh, stuff going around that you don't really want to be there for. Yeah. Um, it was a good way for me to escape. You know, so when I had a piece of paper and like, you know, out here like arguing or fighting in the background, like in my house or whatever, it was somewhere where I could escape and I could go anywhere. Yeah. You know, there, there was no limit to like where I would go and, um, that piece of paper. You could just be anywhere you want type of thing and then mm -hmm. get distracted. Yeah. And that, that's, 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 that's all a good thing too. And did you have that support? Like from like your mom, that like growing up, like, did you have people supporting you as an artist? Mm. Cause it's very different it was, for like a lot of people. It was interesting. Yeah. I went through like, I guess ups and downs because when I was, um, <laughs> when I first started drawing as a kid, um, I don't know why, but I was into drawing like dark shit. I used to draw like, I think it kind of makes sense though, yeah, because like, like of the whole situation. Type like, of like, like yeah. I used to draw like characters all random, like, um, venom or like, um, skeletons or like something like somebody got shot or something yeah. like that. Just like very like, well, cause it, what, it was it kind of cause like, it was like the things that you saw growing up. Like, was it kind of because of that? Or no? I believe so. I yeah. think my outlook on life was kind of negative and my artwork was kind of negative even as a kid. Yeah. So my dad later on, he became a, a art teacher. Okay. But something he told me when I was like first coming up with that art, he's like, you always draw like dark stuff. Like, I don't like it. And mm -hmm. so I think that kind of left an imprint on me that like what I did wasn't art. Yeah. Because I guess because he was an art teacher. Because he didn't see art that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's kind of weird because like, Later on, he ended up doing dark art too. Yeah. Because I guess he reflected on like his Oh, past. so your dad's also an artist now? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, cool. Yeah, cool, cool. so so that was kind of interesting to me and kind of confusing. Yeah. But it wasn't later on until like um, I had to learn like 
my style is my style and sometimes I draw dark stuff. Sometimes I draw beautiful stuff and it's still art. Got you. Got you. And so like, I guess like throughout your whole transition of like from a kid till now, how to have, how have you seen like your art kind of change its form of like the things you've painted? Cause I feel like when you're an artist, especially when you start off young, you're kind of telling your story of like how you grew up and like things you've seen, things, like the way you used to draw, like when you were little and things like that. So I'm like, what progressions have you seen? Like what have you, what like type of drawings that you've done really kind of like you reflect on now and you're like, I'm kind of glad that I painted that or I'm kind of glad that like I drew that or things like that because like now it's something very cherishable to you. Yeah, so when I started off, um, I was also just drawing in with pencils. Mm -hmm. That's how I started off, just drawing pencils. And the reason why, because colors for me were really hard. Mm -hmm. it, I didn't learn until later on that I was actually um, partially colorblind. Oh, okay. Yeah, so when I was doing, when I was trying to mix colors or stuff like that, um, it was hard for me to get the results. Like yeah. me looking at something and trying to copy it, I was like, I don't, it's, it's harder mm -hmm. for me to transition that. So I started off with doing black and gray, you know, just, and I think those gave me the fundamentals. Like later on when I got out of like just drawing dark stuff, yeah. I wanted to get into drawing more like beautiful stuff or nature and things like that. Having that solid foundation, kind of like in sketching basically, helped me progress a lot. Mm -hmm. Helped me understand shapes and forms and everything like that. Yeah. So you grew up kind of like self-taught in a way, right? Yes. Yeah. Like I never took mm -hmm. art classes. That, that's kind of what like I'm kind of leading to is because of like, I don't know, I'm very skeptical on the part of like somebody teaching art, whether it's photography, painting, like that, because when you're teaching it, like for example, you take a class like at the university or whatever, you're getting graded on it. You're getting like A's, B's and C's on like what the professor or teacher thinks of what their form of art is. And so when some people fail the art class, it's like, am I not good at art? Am I not an artist type of thing? But it's like, because yeah, exactly. it's one person grading you. So 100%. like, how do you, how do you feel that? Like, no, yeah, that's, that's how I personally felt because I'm not good with like authority figures and yeah. stuff like that. And I see that at work or even when I was going in school. So to me, something like how art was for me, that escape. Yeah. I didn't want anybody trying to tell me where I could, like where I needed to, right. you know, focus that energy. And especially my dad already had told me kind of like, I don't like that. You know what I mean? I was yeah. like, I don't need another figure in my life kind of telling me, hey, that's not Like art. what's good and what's not good. Yeah, mm -hmm. because like a lot of people do that. Like that's kind of like, I went through that in like my own family kind of life. And I also went that like the first course I ever took at university was like a, a photo, um, I forgot what it was called, like a, a photo class, but like a contemporary art, contemporary photography. And like, I thought I would take like some amazing photos, right? That I told stories and I used to take them to class and the teacher was like, that's not what your assignment was. Like, mm -hmm. that's not what like, it was contemporary art, but they were like, that's not their view on it. And so that slows a lot of people down. Like they're like, am I not imaginative? Am I not creative? You know? And so it takes a toll on people. Yeah. I do yeah. feel like a lot of people do tell me cause being in the art community now, um, I have so many peers and friends that like went that traditional route yeah. and I get so many mixed reviews. A lot of them are just like, the school actually kills artists yeah. sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not for everyone, yeah. you know, and I don't think art always fits that pattern of like, oh, you did this drawing, you hit these parts, you got a 90. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, art, art right. is so that's what That's where I'm like, yeah, like very just so like, I, I agree with you 100%. It's just sometimes you got to go do it on your own and build that self-confidence mm -hmm. and keep going. And, and then I guess like another thing is that like a lot of people always tend to, and I always like talking about this subject is like people think they need the most expensive stuff to get started. Yeah, or they need to know true. somebody like right off the bat to like make it somewhere. And so I really started like liking to ask this question of like, what is your view as a successful artist? A lot of people think it's like, it's the money for them or it's the fame for them or it's, I don't know, something big for them. But in reality, like what's the term success for you as an artist or creative? I think for me, a successful artist is just somebody who's creating enough with what they feel comfortable with. Yeah. You know, because even like full-time artists that are like, they made it financially. They're li doing a living off of right. it. It can be very stressful for them. They could get burned out. So that to me, like, doesn't really measure it mm -hmm. because it's so. It's just such a flexible term, and like some people will just see it as a hobby. Some yeah. people will see it as a career. So I think as long as you're making art and you feel comfortable with how much you're producing and the pace that you're going with, right. you're a successful artist. Just, just I always think go back to like. Just being happy that you're waking up every day doing something you enjoy and you can't wait to get back to it. Mm -hmm. Like that's like, that's like my form. I don't care if I'm like making hundred thousand dollars or like forty thousand dollars. You know, if I'm waking up every day, kind of like just like, hey, I'm excited to do this. You know. Yeah, I, I really felt like um, there was a point where I was in my art career where I was taking up a lot of commissions yeah. and I was getting like booked, mm -hmm. and then 
there's a point where I was just like, I do enjoy it because there's money, you know, and I'm right. like, this is the route I can go to like sustain myself. But then it was like, but I'm not having enough time to draw stuff that I want to draw. I'm right. drawing just what people want. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, oh my goodness, it's a little bit more complicated. I thought it was just going to be like, I just need to find enough commissions yeah. and do this and continue that process. But it was like, dang, that that's not what I actually wanted. As no, no. Another thing is like, you, you kind of do need that though. Like if you're going to be, if you want to be a full-time artist, then yes, that, that's a whole different perspective. Now you do have to focus on treating it as a business, making money. Mm. That. How did you balance it too? Like basically so, like making your own personal stuff and like so I, commissions. I like, what I had to realize was like doing commissions isn't the only way as an artist to make money. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's why when, that's why I kind of messed up because I thought that was the only way you're supposed to make artists, you know? I mean, uh, money. Yeah. But I started realizing, okay, I can go in galleries that I'm producing my own stuff. And I think one of the biggest one that I saw and learned from other artists was like um, how you can maximize a painting. So it's like if I create a painting that, you know, came from my, like something that I wanted to produce, I can make prints, I can make stickers, mm -hmm. I can make it into shirts, I yeah. can make it into, you know what I mean? You can really, like, I like to say milk it. Yeah. You know, but yeah. a lot of people don't like when I use that term because it's just like, no, it's my painting and it's sacred. You know what well, I mean? Well, that's another thing. But, yeah. Like as an mm -hmm. artist, like how do you, like, do you get attached to your paintings that like sometimes like you're not, you can't sell them and it maybe has like a negative effect on you that like you're not making money because you're too attached to them type of thing? So for, for me personally, um, I guess the, how I had my traumatic past and everything yeah. growing up, um, I developed a hyper independence. Yeah. So to me, I'm very self-resilient. So for me, when I make a painting, I kind of have the intentions of selling it and hoping that somebody else will take it in and have it. So I don't have that attachment. Yeah. You know, to me, it's like when it gets sold, it's like you did your purpose. It's sold. Yeah. You know, like yeah. That's what that's what I wanted from okay. it. You know, um, but yeah, I do see I do hang around a lot of artists that are like. I don't want to even want to sell this painting. Yeah. I love it so much. Because I've gone to artists and I'm like, hey, let me buy your thing. And they're like, oh, I can't let it go. I can't like, you know, yeah. sell it. And I'm like, let me know when you do. And they're like, I don't know if I'll ever do it. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. That's where I, I felt it. like I really differentiated yeah. from a lot of artists. I yeah. was just kind of like, nah, he needs to sell. Like, <laughs> Yeah. But I guess that goes back to like making that whole decision of like, what are you making art for? Like, mm -hmm. are you making art just to enjoy? And like, you have maybe another side job or things that you look at or you want to try to make it full time because then that does take that effect like okay now you do need to just let go of your your things you know mm -hmm. so it's also kind of like an emotional thing and, uh, and that kind of ties back to like how do you mentally a lot of artists i like to say they they exp, it's their form of expression on their artwork so like how do you deal with like some of the mental stuff that like, may you go through like maybe emotional things how do you portray that in your art well yeah i think um something i draw a lot of is um like skeletons mm -hmm. so i have this whole series where i draw a skelly fish just like a skull with like a jellyfish kind of like background okay but um yeah that's kind of like i'm i'm also hyper fixated on death a lot okay I, I really do think about how like damn there's gonna be a moment where i'm no longer on this planet yeah and so that's what i draw a lot of because i think about it and to me when i draw death and skeletons and stuff like that it kind of feels like a release of me kind of like embracing like i know that moment will come but i'm here now mm -hmm. so i'm going to try to make the most of it and what's been like some of the like let's let's go first to your first project what was your first project that you've ever done like as an artist just like, ever? like as an artist in general like the project that you really got into that you really wanted to showcase maybe Okay. Um, I, I tried to create, um, children's books. Okay. So I used to write kids stories and then I would find artists to illustrate them. Mm -hmm. And, um, during that time I was also, this was like, damn, this was, this was a long time ago, maybe yeah. like 2012. Okay. You know, okay. and, and, um, I tried to make, um, mini music videos on YouTube. I had some recordings and stuff like that, but, um, ultimately I held myself back because I was too, self-conscious got you so I, I stepped back out of it yeah and mm -hmm. was it was it hard for you to put out because another thing is like a lot of artists they're they're shy to get into the industry because again people focus on like the negative stuff right away mm -hmm. people aren't gonna like me people aren't gonna like my stuff you know people are gonna laugh at me um how how did you do that when you first got your first stuff out there like did you get that negative feedback did you how did you overcome it if you did i think um when i actually started getting into like galleries and stuff mm -hmm. I already told myself like I'm not backing out anymore. So I already yeah. mentally committed myself that this is something I want to do. I understand that 
I'm going to be scared doing it. I'm going to be self-conscious. I'm going to doubt myself, but I'm still going to, I'm going to acknowledge I feel these emotions, but I'm still going to move forward. Gotcha. You know? So it's like when I have like, um, shows at galleries and stuff to me, I really think about, I'm happy and I enjoy that they're on that wall. Mm -hmm. And if somebody were to disagree, I don't pay attention to it, you know? And if somebody were to tell me also, that's a really amazing painting and this and that, I also don't listen to it. <laughs> okay. Cause that's going to be another thing. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you take negative, both negative and positive feedback? Cause mm -hmm. a lot of people, they, they get too, too much ego or too much pride when they get too much positive and they start drifting more of that. And that's what kind of ruins them. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with both? That's so, so to me, I, I don't take it personally at all. Yeah. You know, so, so if somebody says, I hate your art or whatever, I would be like, why? Okay. Like to me, I yeah. see that as an opportunity to collect data. You and, know? and not like, why, like, like why? Because you, you're too prideful of it, but like why? Because you want to understand like mm -hmm. their views on it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. So it's just like, oh, I don't like the composition. I don't like this. I don't like that. I think yeah. you could be doing this. And then to me, it's like, does that align to how I want to create art in the future? Right. It does. He articulated something that I've been trying to do. It's constructive. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or sometimes some people tell you they like it. And even sometimes when you really hone in, you're like, I don't think they really do. They're just lying, yeah. you know? So it's kind of like, I don't try to listen to that right. part either. Because you can tell when someone's just like, just judging and judging and someone was like, they're trying to give you like, hey, maybe try this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Really tell. But um, yeah, so to me, I just try to really focus what I feel I want to produce. Yeah. And I'm going to move forward with that. Mm -hmm. What's been like, maybe one project that you were very fragile to put out? Like maybe like, you were kind of skeptical about it, but you're glad that you put it out because something good came out of it type of thing. <laughs> um. Remember the, what was it? When we were doing the artwork for the movies? Yes. Yes. So okay. I kind of got one. Like me, I always like, I always draw negative, like dark stuff. Who'd you get on that one? Um, Jay. Okay. okay. Yeah. So um, he had the one where uh, a girl was in domestic abuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she was tied down in the chair. Okay. And I thought like, wow, that looks very cool. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. I, I drew her like tied down to the chair. I saw it. Yeah. And then. I was kind of thinking about it. I was kind of like, yo, out of context, people are going to think that looks like some like torture be kind of like weird yeah. kind of thing. You know what I mean? So I was kind of like, I spent like a really long time doing it with color pencils. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like where I felt like, oh, I felt really hesitant of putting it out there. Cause yeah. I'm like, it gives off kind of like a weird dark vibe. You know what I mean? If you don't know the I, context I of the that, story. But then I'm kind of like, it also makes sense because in the end it's art, mm -hmm. you know, like in the end it's okay. You're portraying what the film's about, but it's also... A lot of what I think it is, is like, I think like a lot of people see things like art in a very political way, quote unquote, you know, yeah, um, 100%. But it's like you're portraying life and you're also portraying your views and, mm -hmm. you know, you're portraying emotions, things like that, you know? Yeah. But what I think is kind of funny is like, um, so I had those feelings, right? I was kind of like hesitant to put yeah, it out because yeah. I'm like, this looks kind of like creepy, kind of weird vibes, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but I was just kind of like, whatever, it makes sense with the movie or whatever. So I told myself, I'm totally going to show this painting in a gallery that doesn't have those contexts of like what was going on with the movie and everything like that, because I want to face those weird emotions I was having. Yeah. Like, I don't care that I was kind of thinking like, oh, look creepy or it was kind of too dark or whatever. And then, so I was kind of like, um, that's, that's kind of like what really guides sometimes my art is kind of like, if I feel weird about like drawing something or I feel like I shouldn't, I definitely draw it. That, that actually makes more sense. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's the way a lot it's, of people should go. Yeah, it's you know? kind of like a, a exposure, like therapy. Like, yeah. you know, kind of yeah. like, oh, I feel hesitant with talking about this subject, but sometimes it's kind of like, no, I'm going to draw it and you that should, puts should me more at ease. Yeah. yeah. And so like also, I guess in a way, how does you, like how do you kind of see starting off like as an artist and then especially like seeing when, you're, when your art is done, like how do you know when your art is done? Like, cause a lot so, of people always say like, my art's never done. Mm -hmm. So know? I think that is partially true because with every piece, it's like you learn more, Okay, you know? So I, I can totally see like, if I do, if I do a painting and I feel like this looks good, I'm done. And then I, I let it like sit there for like a couple months and I develop more skills and I look back at it. I'm like, Ooh, I can add to it. Mm -hmm. So I feel as like an artist that's always growing your artwork will always feel like you could have done something, added something a little bit more, done yeah. something a little bit differently. But um, ultimately when I create art and what helps me um, decide like when it's finished or not is I just consider each piece a study. Okay. So when I'm producing art, I'm just like, I'm just learning. 
So even like if it's a painting that's going to go to a gallery, I'm like, I'm just learning here. Mm. And then so when I feel like I learned what I was trying to study in that piece, it's done. Yeah. Time to move on to the next one. And I absolutely hate it when people are like, they've been in something for like three years and like, I know everything. I'm like, there's people mm. who've like been in things for like 20 years and they still have something yet to learn. You know, like you never know everything about something. So I, I feel yeah. like to me, I'll be creating my masterpieces and everything like yeah. that when I'm like a hundred, you know, cause yeah. I just feel like I want to be learning all the way through. And you'll always time. be learning, you know, like mm-hmm. there's not a set time where like everything's just going to stop and stay like that forever. We see no, that definitely. now with like NFTs and stuff, you know, like people are like, oh, art is, has its limit. You know, we sell, we paint, things like that. But now it's like a whole digital space and it's like, it's just a complete different space. Now you got to learn that as an artist. Mm-hmm. When you, when maybe, maybe you shouldn't, maybe like, cause I got in both sides of it. I've gotten people and told me like, I don't want to do the whole NFT stuff because to me, art is just, I don't know, that's fine. That's completely fine. But a lot of people are also like, I want to do it, but I don't know how. And mm-hmm. so you still have something yet to learn and things like that. Yeah. I do try to tell a lot of people that like aren't interested in NFTs. It's gonna, it's like, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. You know, like web 2.0 it, when internet came out and things like exactly that. Exactly. Yeah. When people are like, I don't see the point for me being on Instagram or Facebook. Like, I don't see the, the mm-hmm. reason why I should be on there. And then obviously now it's like, why yeah. wouldn't you be on here? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, this is where everybody's at. Yeah. And I think, um, specifically talking about nfts and how that's building like a bridge with to the metaverse i really feel like this isn't something you can ignore right like, like also i feel like even currently right now um i feel a lot of artists ignore tiktok then and, you shouldn't yeah, and you shouldn't it's, it's like it's one of the easiest platforms mm-hmm. that really helps you grow and it's, it's really organic right now too like before mm-hmm. it starts getting into like Instagram's level where like it's very hard to pick out the algorithm. Mm-hmm. Instagram's not like that right now. And it's very easy. It's like early Snapchat type thing, early Facebook. Exactly. Like that, yeah. And I feel like a lot of people don't jump on it. And then that's why they get into the situations where they, I feel like sometimes they build a negative outlook that like, oh, selling art and being an artist is so hard. But mm-hmm. at the same time, it's like there's all these opportunities that are presented to you. It's more about you not taking them. Right. You know, and it's just learning the drilling new skills, too. And I, I think it's very interesting, like the whole mm-hmm. as an artist entering that NFT space. It's a whole different market, bro. Like it's not one where like you do game. like basic marketing, like you try to get people's attention. It's the people who are in that NFT communities. They're really going to be the ones who tell you where your project is going, regardless of whatever you do with it, regardless of a strategy, regardless of, you know, your roadmap or whatever. Like I've seen projects that like, they're literally, they have no discord. They have no roadmap. They have no, no utilities with it. They just have the piece of art and they sell like that. And then I see other discords where they're like, there are other communities where like they have a project and they have, they have like the best benefits, the best things like that. They don't even sell a damn thing. And so it's a very weird industry. industry. So like as an artist, mm-hmm. it's also very easy. Cause like, if you know how to put your artwork up there, it's, it's, it's a digital game. Like a lot of people are selling like your, your prints and things like that, like in a physical level. But in the digital aspect, you have a lot more of the reach, but you also hits. It's a very weird industry where like you can really kind of like make money very easily Mm -hmm. and things like that. Like there's no yes or no answer to that. Like, am I going to make money or not? Like it's just testing it and throwing it out there. It's kind of weird. Like it is very weird and it's, it's, it's so strange. Like me personally, I see where that's where art is going in the, in the 3d space, um, in the internet. And so to me, that's, that's where I'm headed, Mm -hmm. like full steam ahead. Like there's no hesitation right now. I'm saving up to buy like a $5,000 computer because I want to be rendering. I want to be creating Mm -hmm. 3d objects in gravity sketch and rendering them in, um, you know, certain like game engines even, you know, Mm -hmm. cause I think that's, that's where the market is going. And if you, and, and it's just something I find so interesting too. You know, I think that creating something 3D and with graphics and everything like that, it allows you to do so much more with the characters and especially how the NFT projects are coming out. You can move with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I totally would have so much fun, like creating avatars for people just to use in, yeah. in the metaverse, you know, and that's to me as, as an artist is mm-hmm. very engaging. You know? and, and a lot of people are that for like, too. Like there is people with like, we call them, like, they're called whales in the mm-hmm. NFT industry. Like they just want to buy art because it's cool, mm-hmm. you know. Like they don't want anything in return. They're already like rich millionaires, billionaires. They just want to buy art because it's cool. Mm-hmm. So there's people like that you can target. So it's good to learn those type of things. How do you? How would you recommend? I guess because a lot of artists they still don't want to be on Instagram. They still don't want to be on like social media. And I keep telling everybody over and over, I'm like, do it because there's a lot of benefit to that. How, what would you recommend? I guess like, would you say like 
for sure you got to be on social media is there like another type of view you wing like you see where they're like maybe you don't have to be on social media but you got to do this like how do you market yourself as an artist I, I really do believe you can grow like small and like well i mean even growing on social media is also organically yeah you know but i mean ev even if you like more like the human interaction and like you, you need to be up and out there yeah you know what i mean you need to be the one being at galleries if you don't want to be on social media mm -hmm. and i and i've seen some artists that are able to like you know be very active in the community yeah. not doing it but at the same time they a lot of those artists are the ones that will tell you i want to be a full-time artist yeah and then it's kind of like well you're gonna have to reach a bigger fan base you got to do the work for it too mm -hmm. yeah because a lot so, of people they're shy man and like you can't be shy if you want to get your stuff out there i was like that when i first had my first phone meet in downtown I was the shyest person, bro. 130 people showed up to that. Mm -hmm. And I had to stand in front of everybody on a little stage and talk to everybody. And I was like, oh, dang. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I was so scared. But after I did that, I was like, wow, I can really talk to people, you know? Mm -hmm. And then that's how things have been able to progress. It is, it yeah. is definitely a skill. Yeah. And it's even for people who are shy, I do recommend that like there are people who will market your art for you. Yeah, you there's know? a lot of people, especially in El Paso, bro. Like mm -hmm. El Paso is a very friendly, very nice, like just community oriented place. So it's like, you know, that if you start here, there's people that are going to help you. That's yeah, the whole exactly. reason behind the whole brand and everything too. And and I feel there is like this weird kind of um, assumption that artists that aren't in the community assume that, okay. that like, oh, art is about you know kind of like it's objective and the yeah. people who probably run it are very like stubborn yeah and they're not easy to get along with and so when i talk to artists that aren't in, in like the community that's kind of like a lot of what i get why they're not out there or they say people are only interested in mexican art they're not interested in other forms of art okay yeah. and then but to me it's always like but you haven't been out there Exactly. That's, that's why you have that exactly. most prejudices. Mm. But like once you step out there and you realize, like I remember the first time I ever went to a gallery show was at Casa Ortiz. Okay. And that's where I met Gabriel Marquez and Diego a mm. lot. And they just like welcomed me like, yeah. like they had already known me. Yeah. You know? And, and mm. to me, it was just kind of like, that was really uplifting. Because yeah. I'm like, they're, they're really top artists. So were, you, were you like skeptical of going there? You're like, man, I don't know. Hell yeah. Because yeah. um, yeah. at that time... Um, it was kind of like post pandemic time, right? Yeah. When I started getting into the art community and um, yeah, I felt really hesitant because I had just gotten back from a deployment where I went to Loretto because mm -hmm. I'm an EMT. I work on an ambulance. Yeah. Um, we turned a nursing home into uh, not a nursing home. We turned a hotel into a, a nursing home With to, the whole to treat stuff, COVID right? yeah. patients or whatever. But at that time I had broken up. I got in a, out of a nine year relationship. Oh, man. So I came back to El Paso. I didn't have a job. I didn't have my, my well, I had an ex now. And then um, my my friends, I kind of like moved on. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of like alone. And, and, and you're also a parent too, right? So like, yeah, did you so have your daughter at that time too or no? At that time, when I came back, I, I was, we we're kind of going through like what our, our, our arrangement was going to be, yeah. you know, with the kid and everything. But um, I told her right now I have some time off. I just got back. So I was like, I, I really want to be with her. So give me like a month straight with her. But then we went 50-50 yeah. custody after, after that. But um, yeah, so I came back into El Paso and I was kind of like, I only had my daughter, yeah. you know? And it was kind of like, damn, I really feel, it's, it's funny how you could feel alone even when you got your kiddo because like you can't really have adult conversations. You know what I mean? That, and, yeah. and, and still they, they make you feel like you have purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. But I felt like, damn, I feel kind of like, by but myself was that like your element that you were in where you're like okay i'm in the city because like for example i interviewed um maria brito and mm. she told me she was like she came from venezuela to new york and she knew nobody she didn't know english she didn't know anything like that and like her motive was like that she was gonna prove everybody that told her no wrong was that moment for you like when you had your daughter and you were like i gotta like do this for my daughter like i'm doing this for my daughter i i really did think like it, it seems weird because it seems like it's personal because i was like i need to do this for myself because i need to show my daughter that she can do things for herself yes mm -hmm. you know so there it kind of feels like it'll, uh, that yeah. will carry on over to my daughter and i need to show her that because it, I, I feel like if i just made it about my daughter i feel like she would feel like her life will need to be like me committing to somebody else 
instead of herself. Right. So I don't know if that makes it's sense. Kind of like you know showing I mean? her like, yeah, hey, life gets tough. It's not easy, but you can definitely get through it. You can move and I'm forward. I'm going to show you. Focus on yourself. Yeah. Get healthy, move forward, make those connections, do what you really find interesting yeah. in life. Mm-hmm. And that was really, I feel like that was really important for me to show her because I want her to do that yeah. in her life. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what is your, do you know like yet, yeah, like what your daughter wants to do when she grows up and things like that? Like, does she also want to go in like the art route? Because I also see her like sometimes like at the events, like she's also painting with you and things like that. Yeah. So she, she already is like, I'm, I'm already an artist. Okay. You that's know, cool. yeah, so, yeah. sometimes, um, I remember one time we had, we, we, um, went to an event where we're painting and stuff. And she's like, dad, I'm already faster than you. And Dang. like, this is easy. She's so also was, very like competitive. Yeah. Huh? Oh, Damn. yeah. So I was kind of like, oh, I, 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 there's no doubt in my mind that she will outdo me. And I, what I think is cool too at the same time is she kind of has her own thing where she's into plants too. She likes growing them. Okay. Yeah. So I was kind of like she paint a plants farmer too artist. Yeah, yeah. And stuff like that. So I was kind of like, I like how you got your own vibe and you're trying to go for it already. And, and obviously you're a very supportive parent of all that, right? Because I mm. wanted to see your aspect on that too. Like a lot of parents, cause it's, it's weird for artists sometimes. Like whenever like you, you say, hey, I'm going to want to be a full-time artist, full-time photographer. Right away, people, are, your parents, especially family, are like, no, go get a real job. You know, it's just a hobby. How do you view both aspects of like supporting your child and the people who don't? Okay, so something I tell myself with my, my daughter is like the world that we're in right now it's going to be so different when she's an adult. Exactly. Cause like to me, how I felt and I got to experience that was I was always on a game boy. I was always on the phone yeah. during school. I, I, I didn't pay attention a lot, but now it's like when I do my, even my EMS job, I use my phone to do patient reports and stuff like that. I, um, when I, when I want to get with an artist and do a collab with them or yeah. submit work into a gallery, I do that all on my phone. Mm-hmm. So I understand that like teachers, were telling me, hey, get off your phone and and like pay attention to what's going on right. because they didn't understand that what we're going to be able to do with it. Yeah. So when it comes to my daughter and when she finds something interesting, I say, go do it because I don't know. I don't try to judge and be like, hey, I don't think that's going to help you in the long run because I don't even know how the future is going to look mm-hmm. like, you know. So when I see her playing video games and stuff like that, I recognize Esports is probably going to take over. Dude, esports is huge. Sports, Especially now know? with like, even like, okay, so let's say you, you get into NFTs. Mm-hmm. You can play to earn type of thing. Yeah, exactly. You know? And those are games that pay you, mm-hmm. you know? So it's a good thing to know about. That's where the esports are transitioning to and everything. Yeah, so that's why I tell her like, she, she's playing like Animal Farm, you know? Yeah. And I could, I could personally see it as a, like, what, what is that getting you in life? go study, go read, or go do some homework, Right, you know? And but in fact, they tell same, you that because like they, they never had that as a kid, so exactly. they don't understand it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. like when they're yeah, telling yeah. us to get off our phones, yet yeah, that's exactly what you need now to like function in society. Yeah, everything you know, runs on an it. essential tool. Mm-hmm. So that's why I try not to steer her like away from stuff, but more to like, hey, just go whatever you're interested in because she could be playing Animal Farm and I could try to judge it, but I don't because who knows, she might get into like an NFT game where she could be making money and who knows? There's kids who make more money than their adults. Dude, there's like 12 year old billionaires, millionaires now, bro. It's yeah, crazy. I've seen it with yeah. the. I think there was one NFT problem with like the program with the the long neck. Yes. Did you see that one? Yeah, yeah. she made a couple million she dollars. Like, like 12 million, I think, somewhere around there. It was yeah, so crazy. I'm like, my, my daughter's doodling or doing some kind of art. I'm just like, yo, that might be the mm. next big thing. And not even that. Yeah. Like, it has maybe nothing to do with NFTs, but it's also like, I've seen like weird things happen where like, I don't know if you've seen that, that painting that sold for like millions of dollars. It was literally like, it wasn't even a painting. It was a banana with tape sticked mm-hmm. on the wall and it sold for like 32 million or somewhere around there. Like, yeah, bro, like if that sells, you know, there's something that proves to you that like, you know, you know, what's funny. Um, as an artist, I get asked that question a lot. Mm-hmm. They're like, what do you think about the banana that got taped? Like, what do like, you think about it? So me personally, this is my outlook on it. Yeah. I don't know too much about like the story in general, but to me, I break it down as um, it's just a huge flex on your confidence. You think so? I believe so. Because yeah. f- I feel a lot like as an artist, when you're going to a gallery, you feel like I got to show them my best. Yeah. You know, and, and there's a thing of like, I got to be serious. Yeah. You know, but art isn't always serious. Mm-hmm. So when I see like an artist go into that and be like, I just did a circle. And like, <laughs> that's, that's all I did. Yeah. And I'm going to sell it for $50,000. And then it sells. Yeah. And then it does sell. Yeah. And, it, and to me, that tells me, that tells me, take the shot. You might actually make mm-hmm. it. So to me, it, it, it tells that story. Like it was just more about confidence, just being, you know, assertive enough to be like, 
I'm going to take that shot and right. I might make it. And, and I always tell this story. It's like, let's say, for example, you never tasted pizza in your life. And then you come and tell me, you're like, I don't like pizza. You haven't even tried it. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you know if you don't like it or not? You know, so it's a good thing that you're teaching your daughter, like, hey, go out there and experiment. And especially mm-hmm. when she hits like 20 stuff, she'll still be really young. She'd go out and experiment and fail like fail five years doing nothing and she'll still be young. You, you, you know, know, you know what I think is something that everybody should do with their kids? Um, make make like this like twenty dollar bet. Okay. It's like I'm gonna give you twenty dollars uh-huh. if you can turn this twenty dollars into more money. Okay. You know, yeah, I think I've that because I feel bit. there's a, a lot of people who aren't teaching their kids about money and not even schools. Bro. Mm-hmm, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's it's something that's totally missing. How to grow money? How to take something and you know make it produce more money for mm-hmm. you? So that's something like I came up to my daughter and I was like, Hey, here's twenty dollars. Like do what you can with it yeah. to make more, but I'm not going to give it to you if you're just going to buy candy or whatever. Exactly. You kind of see what they do with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, all right, so what are you going to do? And she was creating her own little budget for like buying <laughs> seeds, pots and plants. And she's like, I'm going to yeah. sell plants. And I was there just you, yeah, That's actually, that's good that she thought like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, it's just kind of like, that's where I want to be, you know, guiding her and like doing little adventures like and, and that. And that's just a great thing to see you like really like analyze who your daughter wants to be. And then you're actually there like helping her. Mm-hmm. Like that's, a lot, that's something that a lot of people don't have growing up. And yeah, because yeah. I feel like that's what I had. That's not, that's not what I had growing up. Yeah. To me, it was kind of like, you need to be a lawyer. You you need to be a doctor. Oh, dude, you need to be successful. Yes. You need to be the one that goes to the next um, social like class ladder. Like you need to be moving the family forward. You need to be this. You need to be a Christian. You need to do that. And I was kind of like, man, I don't feel like I'm being looked at. I feel like I'm being looked through because nobody's really looking at me and what I'm interested in. It's more like, hey, we just want you to mm-hmm. blend in. And, and it took, like, I went through that and it took, it was kind of weird. Like, it took them a while to understand that, like, yes, you can make some sort of living not doing that typical police officer job, lawyer job. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. But you can't force it on somebody like, man, they hated me when I dropped out and I pursued what I wanted to do, like, right off the bat. And so later on, they understood that, like, I was making something out of it. And then now they're like, hey, I'm supporting you, this and that. You yeah, know? so, I, like, to me, that was very powerful. And what I wanted to do was kind of, like, I wanted to live my own life. So that's why when I was 18, I moved out. Yeah. I moved out on my own, and I was kind of, like, learning how to, like, become financially independent, which was really hard because I hadn't learned it at all yeah. from my family or from school. So I went through the terrible funk where I got, like, evicted from my apartment and like yeah yeah. it it was it was pretty rough accumulated some debt but um it was a really good um real world learning experience Mm -hmm. that like people are always saying money doesn't buy you happiness but like ignoring it and not paying attention to it that that could get you in a lot of trouble well i view it as like yeah okay it doesn't buy you happiness but it does buy you opportunities to help others oh definitely you know like Mm -hmm. a lot of people are like no it shouldn't be all about the money and I'm like, yeah, it shouldn't, but I still want to pursue it because it's not the intention of me getting the money and like being selfish and like doing stupid stuff with it. It's me getting the money to help other people and things like that. So yeah. it's, just, it's just your whole perspective I, and view on it type I, of thing. I remember I, um, I heard this really cool, interesting study where they kind of try to find out how much income does an individual need and what, like if they start giving you more than that, it doesn't really affect your happiness. And they're, okay. and, they're saying, and they're saying um, somewhere where that lands about is about sixty to 70000 mm-hmm. for an average person to feel like I make good money, I feel comfortable, I'm not in debt, I'm doing like vacations and everything like that. But then after that cutoff, it didn't really matter how much money you made. Yeah, It, it doesn't affect your happiness. It's not going to make you more happy or more sad. Okay. After that, it just goes into your personal character and what you have, like yeah. flaws or imperfections going on. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a very interesting case. And I, and I also view it in a way where it's like, I, see, I saw this thing somewhere and I forgot where it was. But it's just life now just doesn't make sense the way people want you to pursue it. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's like, I read something where it was like, people think it's okay for you to get $5,000 in debt in college but it's not okay for you to take out a loan to start a business. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's literally the, the just of like growing up as a young adult to an adulthood type of thing. It's like, okay, you're putting yourself in debt, but they still don't allow you to take out money to start your own business. And I get it. It's a whole political thing type of thing like that. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's a very interesting type of thing. And I, I feel like those are the opportunities that I think a lot of people need to take more. Yeah. Of just trying to be like, I have this random idea. Let's see what can see what can do with it you know Mm -hmm. and you might find yourself doing something you're so you love and you're so passionate about 
for the rest of your life. Exactly. And like to me, that's worth the, the chance, mm. you know? Exactly. And what, what was something that you learned like as an artist and a creative that, that like you learned it and you're glad that you learned it and it really helped you? As an artist? An or, artist, or did and you mean? Like, yeah. as a, like as a creative, like when you were like becoming like, you're, you were doing your paintings, you were becoming an artist. What was something that you learned in the art industry that like you glad that you took the time to learn it because it really ended up helping you? I think it was um, the the connection and everything I built with people. Because mm -hmm. to me, it was like um, when I got there in the art, well, when I was talking about like I had come back from the deployment in Loreto yeah. and I came back to El Paso and I was kind of like lonely or whatever. That's when I told myself I'm going to pursue my art career and I'm going to really like not hold myself back. And I just found such a deep connection with people who were interested in what I was interested in. Yeah. And that to me, like, I felt such a, I feel such a strong bond with the El Paso community. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm so grateful that, you know, I found like-minded people who are willing to dedicate their time and energy to, yeah. you know, doing creative stuff. What's been like, I guess it might've been that Loretto like whole thing, but like something that like you kind of had to sacrifice in order to keep going, like as an artist type of thing. Like, I think it was like my, what I was doing with my time. Okay. You know, because it's like I can be watching Netflix or I could be focusing on girls or like doing that kind of stuff, but I won't have time for my art. Yeah. So I really felt like I did have to sacrifice kind of like um, just going out there and having fun, which I, I still do, um, but not as much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's it's not like where I'm constantly doing it. It's kind of like I do have to exert some kind of like discipline where I need to make time for my projects, yeah. you know, and that does take away from that time. But I think in the long run, it's more worth it because I get more fulfillment mm -hmm. from doing those things than doing the other things. And, and I may think, and I might be wrong, but I may, I think that maybe that's the part where a lot of like artists get stuck is because it, you do have to take that decision of like, what am I going to do with my time and not go out and party and drink and things like mm -hmm. that, you know, like. And, and also financially as well. Yeah. Because e even like I see some artists that like, they, their cash flow is just kind of like, I make money selling like some paintings and stuff like that, but then it goes back to like, you know, just expenses and like doing some other stuff. Yeah. Like, like to me personally, all money like I generate for my art, I just pump it back into getting more art supplies, creating more. Like reinvest more it things. in yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's something that's very important is to keep reinvesting in yourself as well, time and money. Mm -hmm. What would, what would be your top three things as an artist that you would for, that you for sure learned throughout your journey that you're like, I recommend this, this, and this, especially like as a starting artist for anybody starting up. I think for anyone starting up, it's going to be to be looking into the metaverse. Okay. You know what I mean? I agree. And, and creating I agree. NFTs and seeing what's going to be this new like digital art phase that we're going to go and into. And maybe not even like creating them, but just learning about it. Mm -hmm. Create, cre learning the, the lingo. Cause like to me, I, I feel like I have some projects that are coming up and I see NFT as being, as being the way of fueling those projects, mm -hmm. you know, and being a part of, and it's not just like you're limiting yourself to like being a part of community here locally, but you're part of communities that are international and mm -hmm. other artists, you have connections with other artists, like buying one gives you access to like, for example, like the board apes, the board apes, like you buy one and it gives you access to a bunch of celebrities, things like that, you know, like exclusive, like um, meet and greets with them, things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's more of like, it goes kind of goes back to kind of what you mentioned earlier, like the whole networking opportunity of it. Like if you take a chance on this, how is it going to connect you to something else? Nice versa type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cause like I, I see myself in the future. Um, I'm, I'm saving up and I'm trying to get money to build um, that computer. Yeah. But um, I really see myself trying to create a, a gallery in the metaverse. Yes. You know what I mean? So like my plans are, to have this virtual gallery where NFTs are on the wall and if people want to buy them, you get the NFT and you get the actual real live art sent to you. And you see it now, like for example, I saw this thing today where it was like the Miss Universe. They just had their their public mint, like their public sale, like go live today. You can and go party with them, right? Yeah, you could go party with them. Like if you get one, you're like, okay, you get an exclusive meet and greet with whoever wins. You get to like go and have a dinner with them, things like that. And so by doing that, you get instant access, instant connections to other people. You don't have to go through that step-by-step step type of thing anymore. You do one thing and boom, you're already there. That's yeah. how easy it is. Because I, 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 um, so I have, I have a lot of projects on the way yeah. and 
each one I try to think about like how can I get NFTs involved in this project? Yeah. And so I I we I do have um a podcast coming up soon. Um and it's called the Owl's Nest. And the way I see like myself like integrating my art yeah. into that podcast as like obviously creating NFTs, but it's like why do people want to purchase these NFTs, mm -hmm. you know? And so I was going to market it as like, if you buy this NFT for this podcast, you'll be allowed to um, ask questions on a live stream, you know, while, okay. while the podcast is going on and it'd be like, oh, we have a question from so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And then if you buy this other one, that's more rare NFT um, that costs more, you can actually get five minutes of, you know, a FaceTime to ask some yeah. questions and talk to okay. the, that's the person that's, that's getting really interviewed. You know what I mean? You're giving utility out there rather mm -hmm. than just, you know, right now I always think it's like 70% artwork. I mean, 70% utility, 30% artwork. Mm -hmm. You got to see what you're giving them. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then like, um, I'm also, um, working with some people on a, a comic Yeah. and we want to do it where it's a 3d comic. So I recently bought the Oculus. Okay. So, um, I've been creating some 3D art and figuring out how to, um, you know, create those modules and everything like that. So yeah. when I get my computer, we can put them in and render them mm -hmm. out and add some really high quality graphics. But um, it's crazy how you can create these whole environments, you mm -hmm. know, like um, that people can visit in the virtual world. And what's crazier about it is you can sell an NFT and people can visit these worlds, yeah. you know, if they have that access. Not only that, like with the whole comic thing, what you can do is you could do a whitelist, like a pre-sale type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you can sell each individual like strip of the comic as an NFT. Yeah. And like people can start collecting sketches, them, you know? character developments mm -hmm. and everything like that. To build and, like the whole mm -hmm. comic thing, like they can start buying each one. Yeah. That's see, that, that really that's helps. what I love about the whole NFT space mm -hmm. is just like, there's such a way to get like a Kickstarter kind of vibe yeah. of people supporting you mm -hmm. and your dream that I feel like as artists, if you're not going that way, you know, you're, you're going to miss out on yeah. a lot of opportunities. And especially like an illustrator, like if you're a, an illustrator, like you draw for books and all that, like that's a smart thing. Like I saw that in LA, we met some guys in LA and they were like, we're selling each little strip of the comic as an NFT. And if you want mm -hmm. to keep knowing more about the story, you obviously have to purchase the rest of the story. And that's, that's a smart thing to do, especially as an artist. Like if you're an illustrator, oh, definitely like that, like you tell a story and you so, sell them. So I'm also, um, working on a poetry book Yeah, and it's the, um, the boy with a thousand names. And that's kind of like when I was growing up, I had a bunch of nicknames. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's a poetry book, but I plan on selling each single page as an NFT. There you go. You know, and it's just kind of like, I, I, I want to create some digital artwork and mm -hmm. some real artwork and kind of make it like a, like a kind of like make it a game where it's like, if you collect, let's say I'm going to have a hundred um, po poems. Um, if you collect them all, you're going to unlock like all this art that I created for, yeah. you know, whoever has the whole book. And there's people out there that are just also just collectors. They just mm -hmm. want to collect it. So that's an, that's a thing for them that they get. So that, that's definitely awesome. I don't want to talk too much about the NFT space. I know we're kind of running short on time, okay. but is there any like piece of advice, like a, a certain thing that like either that was given to you or that you want to give out that like, if somebody would come to me and be like, hey, I want to be an artist, what would you like advise me to? Like, what would, what would that one thing be? I would say um, just dive in. Just do it. Just dive in. You're going to be skeptical. You're going to be doubtful. And the, your worst enemy is going to be yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the only person you have to get out of the way is yourself. And you'll, you'll quickly realize, especially in the El Paso art community, yeah. that everyone's rooting for you. Absolutely. Especially in El Paso. Mm -hmm. Especially in El Paso. It's so easy for somebody to just connect and be like, help That's me That's why I love it here, man. Yeah. I, I don't plan on going anywhere. I know a lot yeah. of people are like, I can't wait to get out of El Paso. But for me, it's well, kind of like, I, I love this city and I love yeah. um, the people in it. I see that. I see that 100%. Like, I love the city too, man. Dude, I, it's crazy. I've been like a lot of places and there's no place like home, bro. There's mm -hmm. literally no place like El Paso. And so... But that's also kind of a bad thing too because if you want to stay in El Paso, it's kind of hard to make it in El Paso. Like everybody has to leave El Paso to really make it. Like, what do you think about that? No, yeah. So um, that was actually, um, do you know Paola? She's the one that did oh, like no. the, the, the mural here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I did, a, I was doing a mural with her, a chalk one at El Paso Children's. Yeah. And we were kind of talking about that, you know? And she really told me that um, she was going to make her effort to try to make El Paso a city where artists feel like they can come here 
and, yeah. and feel like there are programs. And it is and turning like, like that. that too. And I feel like uh-huh. it takes like the people in, the, especially the creatives here in El Paso to really showcase that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and when she told me that, I was kind of like, I'm down for that cause. Like, you know, oh, I, hell yeah. I, I want to stay here and try to make it, you know, fi- find how to network and everything mm-hmm. like that, promote artists and yeah. stuff like that. And I think that's mm-hmm. totally worth it. It's bringing the spotlight to El Paso. And that's mm-hmm. the reason why like, the podcast, like I'm able to also like, it's cool because I'm, I'm able to interview people from outside El Paso, like New York mm-hmm. and all that, and they never knew about El Paso. And so the moment that they did, it was like, it was like, a, like El Paso seems like a cool place type of thing, you know, like, mm-hmm. hey, El Paso is like, you know, I should bring me go visit El Paso. And like they never knew about El Paso, which is a really cool thing. Yeah. Because like now you're, you're giving like El Paso that exposure that it needs. So I, I definitely do think El Paso will be that art community. It's going to take time to get there where I feel people will feel like, I want to go to El Paso to be an artist. I think it it will take time, but it'll get there. But also at the same time, while that's happening, there's still a lot of growth that you can reach through the internet. Yeah. You know? So, so for me during that time until El Paso becomes that, like that crazy art city. Yeah. In the meantime, I'm going to be trying to get some resources to help develop that. To help bring that here. Yeah. And it's always, you just send a message to somebody and you don't even know if they're going to reply. Yeah, exactly. The fact that they they could reply and you get something. It's crazy. The power to slide into someone's dm like you know like (laughs) it's insane like um i remember when i first started doing collabs in my art career it was like i would ask somebody like yo you down to like do a painting together or whatever and Mm -hmm. i was always shocked when they're like yeah when you're free and i was like damn that's all it took just just a little bit of courage just to be like Mm -hmm. you down or not like you know and you don't even even know what's gonna come out of that maybe something big could change your life it takes one thing one thing that's all it takes and what's that one thing that like you know now that you wish you would have known when you first like started as an artist and things like that i think how i was saying like just to not hold yourself back don't hold yourself back don't hold yeah. yourself back take the opportunities and even though you're skeptical and you're doubtful just move forward with it just do it yeah. acknowledge it and just keep going mm-hmm. well thank the man thank you so much for being on here man i appreciate you Don, for like, it was coming all mine. On, you know and just just to give yourself a plug real quick just go ahead and tell people like where they can reach you where they can contact you things like that so you can find me on um Instagram, Luis Jesus Marin. That's also my TikTok. I also have a YouTube channel that I started, The War of Art. And I like that. Also, we're going to have my first um, podcast that's going to be coming out, and it's called The Owl's Nest. The Owl's Nest. What is that one going to be about? Like just pure art talk, or what is it about? Basically, but I just want to talk to musicians, kind of like what's going on in El Paso. Got you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I really do like finding like more of, not not underground, but just I feel like people that do need attention that mm. I feel like they're not receiving enough of it. Exactly. You know, yeah. try trying to give them exposure mm. to it too. Well, I love that. I love that, man. And I love the whole like ambitious part of you. Like you're somebody who I see that's like, you're always trying to do something for the benefit of something. Like you're not just doing it for your own cause. Like you're doing it to like benefit other people. You're doing it to help other people. The EP secret thing that you have, mm-hmm. it's, it's something really cool. Yeah. yeah EP, EP secret is so much fun creating TikToks and, you know, being able to help El Paso, people in El Paso get the light shown on them. Yeah. You know, and like you showcase each, feels... like every little event, which is what I like about it too. Like you just mm-hmm. see what's out there and you actually take the time to look it up, you know? Yeah. And, cool. and I love being there, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Post pandemic and everything. It's good to be out there with the people. It was tough. It was a tough time to not interact with people. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of glad that like podcasts are a thing. Because yeah, like for you're real. able to just like connect to the people. Honestly, that's why I'm glad virtual reality is coming in. Dude, yes. You know, you just jump on an Oculus and be like, hey, I'm with, you know, it's pretty cool, pretty dope. But um, hey, guys, thank you so much for just tuning in today's episode. Make sure you guys go check them out. Make sure you guys go check out um, Garelia Rincon. Um, we'll leave their stuff here in the description, you know, when they have events, things like that. Tino, thank you so much for letting us use the spot. And um, we'll catch you guys in the next episode. Thank you so much.